Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We see people are coming in. So we'll give everyone about one more minute and then I will start with introductions. Welcome to those of us who are joining right now. As I mentioned, we'll give everyone one more minute just to sign in and then we'll begin. Welcome. So just to be respectful of everyone's time, I will start with our introductions and then we'll have more people joining us throughout the hour program. So good afternoon, everyone. Program. My name is Bor Lachi and I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Director of Studies at the Tower Center. We are excited to partner with the Rolling Center for Business Law and Leadership and also the Hunt Institute for Engineering Program. A little bit of how today is going to go. I'll introduce our moderator who will then introduce our speakers. Both our speakers will give their insights, then we'll have a short moderated discussion followed by the Q, by Q&A. So we do ask as much as many of y'all have noticed, we disabled the chat function, so please and put all your questions in the Q&A. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Eric Hinton. Eric is the director of the um, Rolling Center for Business Law and Leadership at SMU Dedman School of Law. He has over 10 years of experience teaching international business law, European Union law, and ethics and compliance at the SMU Dedman School of Law, Loyola Chicago University School of Law, University of Illinois Chicago Law School. He also lectures regularly in the MBA programs at the University of Texas at Dallas in the Jindal School of Management. Eric, I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you, Bora. The Rolling Center at Dedman Law is focused on cutting edge business law and leadership topics, and so we appreciate the opportunity to present this program today in conjunction with the Tower Center and also the Hunt Institute. Today's topic is a return to globalism, what U.S. companies can expect from the Biden administration. And our ambitious task today is to discuss the impact um, on U.S. companies of the Biden administration's re-engagement, um, or per perhaps I should say United States re-engagement um, on matters of international trade and ESG. And it is my honor to introduce our panelists today, Ambassador Demetrios Morantes and Professor Ava Chalky. Uh, I actually met uh, Demetrios Morantes when I was a law student many years ago at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, and he was working as an associate attorney uh, with Aiken Gump in Brussels. And now 23 years later, Ambassador Morantes serves as the Senior Vice President, Global Government Engagement, leading Visa's Global Government Engagement Team and is responsible for partnering with government officials around the world to advance policies that foster the growth of electronic payments. He joined Visa from Square, uh, where he led the global policy, government, and regulatory affairs function. Prior to that, he served as acting United States trade representative and also deputy United States trade representative, where he was responsible for US trade negotiations and enforcement in Asia and Africa, including the very important Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP as well as another uh, number of other trade and investment treaties. He also spent time in Hanoi as chief legal advisor for the US Vietnam Trade Council. And he worked for five years in Washington, DC and Brussels, Belgium with the offices of the law firm Aiken Gump. He holds a Juris Doctor from Harvard Law School and an AB in Public and International Affairs from Princeton. So welcome Ambassador Morantis. Hi, Eric, thank you. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Yeah, we're happy to have you. Thank you so much. Dr. Ava Chalky is the executive director of the SMU Hunt Institute for Engineering and Humanity and is also a Tower Center associate here at SMU. She's also the co-founder of the Inclusive Economy Consortium. She has 25 years of global experience in the areas of climate smart, inclusive economic development and fostering solutions to pressing societal problems in those areas through innovation and social entrepreneur approaches. Dr. Chalky's work leverages transforma transformational technologies for high impact, high impact solutions from energy efficiency, renewable energy and water purification to climate smart agriculture and sustainable and inclusive value chains, which we'll speak more about today. Prior to joining SMU and the Hunt Institute, she worked for 18 years 
at the International Finance Corporation, which is a private sector arm of the World Bank. Dr. Chalky has served as an advisor to the G20, the OECD, and various UN agencies. She's also served on the Dallas Mayor's Poverty Task Force and on the Advisory Council of the Texas 100 Resilient Cities Initiative. She has an MS in Finance from George Washington University and a PhD in Public Policy from Duke University. So Dr. Chalky, welcome. Thank you so much for having me and hi everyone. So today's program, first of all, is being recorded and will proceed as follows. As Bora mentioned, Ambassador Morantis will provide some introductory remarks and then I'll ask him some prepared questions. We will then hear introductory remarks from Dr. Chalky and we'll ask her prepared questions. We encourage the audience though to uh, ask questions throughout the program and I will pose them to our panelists as time permits. Um, you can put those in the Q&A function at any time and then we will uh, conclude approximately at 1.15 central time. So Ambassador Morantis, we're going to move to you first. So take it away. Terrific. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you so much for, for um, having me today. You know, so the theme, I guess, of today's um, panel is return to global globalism and what can we expect from a Biden administration. You know, I've had many years, um, probably too many, Eric, you mentioned, gosh, it was 23 years ago that we met. That's, that's, that's a shocking disclosure. <laughs> um, but when you think about trade policy and you think about um, what President Biden has said, he's talked a lot about making trade relevant um, to the middle class, making trade uh, policy worker centric. Um, and, and what does that actually mean in practice? I think for me, and, and when I think about this, the way to really make that goal relevant is to really focus on small businesses. Small businesses are the engine of commerce. Small businesses are the backbone of, of economy. And small businesses generate um, the most amount of private sector jobs. Um, and when you think about small businesses and in an international trade space, what does that mean? That really, I think, for me, again, it means um, really trying to make global commerce relevant to small businesses. And in the wake of COVID, that's ever more important. Small businesses have been the, the, the ones that have suffered the most. And in order to make small businesses really, um, you know, to really help stimulate their recovery, having small businesses participate more robustly in global com commerce is ever more important now. Why? Because COVID has shown us that small businesses that are digitally enabled are the ones that are most likely to succeed. E-commerce has grown tremendously um, during this period. It's grown by 10% domestically, and it's grown by 25% on a cross-border basis. So if small businesses are more digitally enabled, small businesses have a, have a greater ability to participate in this fantastic growth of e-commerce. But the trouble is around the world, we're seeing more and more barriers to cross-border e-commerce, which is why digital trade is ever more important to small businesses. And so when I think about what the Biden administration um, can and should do to make its trade policy more worker-friendly um, and really a, an integral part of the Biden administration's effort to, to generate economic recovery and spur economic growth, digital trade policy, digital trade agreements are probably the most important thing that we can do. We can break down the barriers that prevent small businesses from trading globally um, and really have that be a force multiplier for small businesses. Um, so Eric, when I, when I think about um, you know, what should the Biden administration do, I would really do a, a, a real focus on digital trade. And I think that could be a real legacy um, for Team Biden, particularly in helping spur the recovery of small businesses as we emerge from COVID. That's great. And I really want to dig into some of those points, uh, specifically around uh, particular uh, policy initiatives that the Biden administration could undertake, as well as uh, what you view Visa's role um, is in actually accomplishing some of those things in the private sector. So, you know, kind of digging in more to the, to the policy side of things, um, 
I'd love to get your thoughts as, as to where, at least at this point, it's very early in the administration, we just barely have a, a new USTR. Um, what are some of your thoughts as far as the direction you see the Biden administration actually going on trade uh, issues? And, and could, you know, if you don't mind, you know, I, I, I'd like you to kind of put it into perspective of where we've just come from, right? Which I think is a very different um, perspective. And, and then, you know, alongside of that, um, what is sort of your view of what industry's sort of been doing during the last four years versus what the administration's been doing? Yeah, sure. So uh, look, no, there are huge challenges that we face right now. Um, and, uh, it, you know, on the international trade front um, and um, President Biden nominated and the Senate just confirmed Catherine Tai to be the new U.S. trade representative. Ambassador Tai is amazing. She has a, a long history of experience on trade issues. She's a seasoned and savvy negotiator, um, and, and she knows you know, better than anybody that trade policy is really an arm of domestic policy. And as President Biden is focusing so heavily on, on recovery through you know, the COVID relief package, focusing on infrastructure, trade policy plays a critical, critical role in that. Um, and again, you know, going back to my introductory comments, one of the areas where we've actually made progress um, over the past four years and progress has been made around the world and it's an area that ambassador Tai can really accelerate um, is this area of digital trade it was a um you know a real um centerpiece of the uh newly concluded u.s mexico canada agree agreement um, it's been an area that uh, countries, particularly in the Asia Pacific, has, have been focusing on. Why? Again, it's a way of generating economic recovery. It's a way of making uh, trade relevant to small businesses. Um, and it's an area that, that Ambassador Tai will have a foundation on which to build, both bilaterally with, with countries who want to move quickly, regionally, particularly in the Asia Pacific, where there's a real desire um, and willingness to conclude digital trade agreements, as well as multilaterally in the WTO, which is going to be an important area for Ambassador Tai as we think about returning to globalism. The WTO has been fairly broken um, recently, and there's a, a new director general. There's a, you know, a new willingness, I think, to try to uh, reinvigorate um, the multilateral trading system through the WTO. And again, digital trade provides a great opportunity to do so in that context as well. That's very helpful. Um, I have a couple of questions from our, our participants and you know, I wanna flesh out uh, a little more specifically what you mean when you say digital trade. And I would add to that um, sort of at a high level, what does that look like in an actual trade agreement? No, Eric, that's a great question. And it, I mean, it's too often, you know, trade nerds like like me go diving right into the weeds without providing context. So, so when think about e-commerce, you know, think about um, the ability to to buy and sell things um, on a cross-border basis. So, sitting at your computer, you know, making a purchase um, from a small business in France or um, or vice versa. That relies on the ability of data to flow on a cross-border basis. So I can't really make a purchase from a small business in you know, Poland um, if, my, if, if my data cannot flow between you know, my computer and, and Poland. Too often right now, we're seeing governments put restrictions in place that undermine the ability of data to flow freely. So, for example, governments sometimes for, you know, sometimes for understandable reasons, misguided, but understandable reasons are requiring data to be sourced and housed locally in their particular jurisdiction and will put restrictions on the ability of data to enter freely into their country should their um, data not be housed in their own local jurisdiction. Now, sometimes governments say do that because they're concerned about privacy, they're concerned about security, but all of those, um, you know, those well-intentioned reasons are oftentimes misguided. Um, and let's take security, for example. 
you know, sometimes governments will say, okay, I need data in my jurisdiction. It can't flow across border because I need to protect it. I need to protect the data of my citizens. What ultimately happens um, in that case is you wall yourself off and you make yourself as an economy much less secure from a cybersecurity perspective than you would otherwise. Take Visa. One of the things that's foundational to what we do as a company is, is fighting fraud. So you as a cardholder don't have to worry about fraud on your card. How do we do that? We rely on very sophisticated algorithms that take data from all over the world and analyze it to make sure that we're able to spot and identify fraud. If a government says, you can only do that within my border, then we don't have access to the data you know, around the world that would show us and, be, and make it easier for us to hone in on where the actual fraud is taking place. So data localization policies end up making, um, making us, making small businesses, making the ecosystem less secure. That's why it's really important. That's one of the many reasons why it's important to ensure that cross-border data can flow freely and that governments aren't putting misguided um, policies in place that restrict that. It's interesting. So uh, let's go to the, the what this looks like on some level in actual trade agreements. So you mentioned a multilateral approach as well as um, you know a, a bilateral approach. And maybe my question at the multilateral level would be: Would would agreements around digital trade liberalization kind of fall under the regular WTO concepts of uh, you know MFN and non discrimination, or would, would there be a different kind of approach? And do you see that mirrored in? bilateral agreements or would there be something different? I think, look, by virtue of the fact that the WTO has, you know, so many members, it will take more time. You know, there are e-commerce negotiations underway there. I think that um, that's a, a very good way to get these provisions, um, you know, memorialized in the WTO, but that will take time. In the interim, there are blueprints out there of, of governments that have done this well. The USMCA is an example, but I, I would point to um, a, a recently concluded digital economy agreement um, that was done between Australia and Singapore. Um, it's, in my view, it's really the blueprint for a best-in-class digital economy agreement that does things like forbid data localization, but ensures that concerns that governments have about data use and about privacy are adequately addressed in that agreement. So not only does the Singapore-Australia agreement prohibit restrictions on cross-border data flows, but it encourages regulatory cooperation on issues like privacy, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, all of the bedrocks um, of the international digital economy are all accounted for in um, the Australia-Singapore Digital Economy Agreement. You know, Chile and New Zealand um, have, have also um, taken really strong action in this direction. Japan has been a real leader in promoting the concept of the, you know, the free flow of data with trust. Um, so they're, they're, the ingredients are out there for um, taking what's already in existence and growing um, support for them among countries so that at the end of the day, you could take that to the WTO um, and, and you know, have that become a part of the, the WTO e-commerce negotiations. But to me, I think the smartest thing to do is start with willing partners and then you know, evangelize that with others. So I think that's a good segue into one of our uh, audience questions, which is related to TPP. And, you know, I guess that's a question on a lot of our minds is what, if any future is there for the United States in the TPP, um, which uh, I believe addresses e-commerce. Um, so my thought is, first of all, um, do you think that's something in the cards uh, that would be, I, I guess, politically feasible for President Biden, given the current um, uh, political environment? And if so, does that sort of help uh, with uh, the, the digital trade matters that you're mentioning? Um, and, and would it make US trade policy more uh, worker friendly? So I spent, you know, five years more than that of my life on TPP. And, and of course, I was, you know, devastated when, when the US um, withdrew from that. 
Um, you know, one of the centerpiece parts of TPP, as, as you mentioned, were provisions on digital trade. Um, as much as I would love to see the, the U.S. rejoin TPP tomorrow, I just don't think it's it's in the cards. Politically, it would be extremely controversial. And, you know, if I were President Biden, he has other things that he needs to focus on that he needs to um, expend political capital on, you know, whether it's, um, you know, infrastructure, healthcare, or, or, or whatnot. Um, and so what does that mean for trade policy? Well, maybe at some point in the future, the U.S. will be in a, in a, in a place where we've done the domestic, um, you know, the things we need to do domestically that will enable us to join um, agreements like TPP. But for now, let's do what we can. Digital trade is not politically controversial. Um, there is a huge constituency for it. It benefits workers. It benefits small businesses. It's doable. It would be a really big win, you know, and from there, let's see where we go. Um, but I think we need to start with what's possible, both from a negotiating perspective, as well as from what's, you know, what's doable politically. And I do think digital trade is one of those areas that, you know, goes right into that sweet spot in a way that unfortunately TPP just at this point juncture in time does not. So, uh, so maybe just a, a brief uh, comment too, this comes from one of our audience question is just globally, how do you feel the Biden administration will um, approach China um, and especially in uh, sort of the context of, of how the Trump administration uh, had uh, approached China? I, I mean, I think both the Trump administration and, and the Biden administration have very similar concerns with respect to the U.S. relationship with China. I think, you know, President Trump tried to address those concerns in, in one particular way, which was going a bit more unilateral um, than is, is, you know, traditional in the U.S. I think President Biden will probably approach it more in concert with um, like-minded like -minded allies. But the concerns that are animating President, that animated President Trump's China, China policy are the very same concerns that um, President Biden faces. And those are concerns that um, are not Republican concerns or Democratic concerns. It's, there's, you know, there's very little, you know, there's very little consensus um, across the aisle on, on issues. China is one of those areas where there, where there is um, an overwhelming amount of bipartisan consensus. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of work that that President Biden is going to have to do in thinking about how to address um, the 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 um, the distortions that are in the trading relationship right now and how to best do that in concert with with, um, you know, friends and allies. I think that will be the big difference between the trade policy as it relates to China um, from the previous administration into this administration. Very helpful. I'd like to turn now just in the uh, last uh, few minutes that we have uh, about the whole idea of what is a small, small business and in particular what uh, Visa is able to do to really help um, both substantively and technically um, support small businesses. So one of our questions is about um, basically what a small business is and, and our um, Commenter says that the U.S. government defines a small business as 500 uh, employees or less. And, and first of all, what percentage of, of those types of business actually are engaged in the global arena? The second portion, you know, I'd like to have you talk about what Visa does to really support small and medium-sized businesses. Yeah, I mean, we are maniacally focused as a company on, on small and micro businesses. I mean, our, our focus is really on Though on, on, on really the, the smallest um, of, of small and micro businesses. And, and again, you know, what I said earlier about what we learned from COVID and about the importance of digitally enabling small businesses to be able to succeed is really what's animating how Visa is, is looking at small businesses. So we've made a commitment to digitally enable 50 million small businesses in the next three years. Um, the Visa Foundation has been focused um, very heavily on how it can provide support um, to small and micro businesses, particularly those that are women owned. We announced a, a $200 million commitment last year um, globally where this is really our focus is how to help small businesses recover 
small and micro businesses recover from um, the rab the economic ravages of COVID. Um, and you know, we are a platform. You know, some people think of Visa as a bank. We're not a bank. We're we're a technology platform that connects customers um, to merchants. And we see through our platform how important it is for small businesses to be able to transact on that platform and to have that global reach um, to be able to reach customers in, in markets around the world, which then goes back to the original uh, comments I was making about, you know, we can see as, as, as a global platform why digital trade is so important. And so getting digital trade right will complement the efforts that we're making as a company to digitally enable small businesses, to provide small businesses they, they need to start, run, and grow and thrive in a post-COVID economy. Excellent. Uh, a final question uh, relates actually to health data. Um, so, uh, and, and this is probably different than obviously what Visa is um, undertaking really with your platform, although correct me if I'm wrong, but how do you think that health data should fit into um, the conversation of digital trade and communication platforms, and should we be moving to some other types of standards, including open source standards? I, you know, I mean, I don't want to sort of go over my skis because I don't know the area of health data in the same way that I, that I know other areas. I know that you know there there are efforts underway that people are thinking about, you know, with respect to you know having, you know, digital type vaccine passports um, that would you know use um, you know, vaccine data um, as a way of helping to stimulate international travel again, et cetera. But I'm not really an expert in that area and, and I don't want to comment on an area that I don't know well. Maybe let me ask it this way though, is um, do these uh, trade agreements, how do they treat things like health data or, or as you mentioned, some of the legitimate reasons why you might want to have uh, data localization or or prevent transfer and and what do those sort of exemptions or exceptions look like within the context of an agreement i see uh, no no that makes a lot of sense look privacy is a huge issue and that's been a huge concern um as to why you know we shouldn't have agreements that help promote uh, cross-border data flows and this is why the australia singapore agreement is so novel and so trailblazing is it it recognizes that cross-border data flows have to go hand in hand with data use. And that, you know, for a company like Visa, a customer needs to be able to control his or her data. And that's not inconsistent with, with very robust provisions on digital trade. Um, you can do both at the same time. You can ensure that customers are able to have control over their own data at the same time that, that you're ensuring that that data is able to flow um, across borders. And, and again, that is the, the it's, it's a novelty in the Singapore-Australia agreement that I think is going to allow this issue to really move forward and to be able to bridge the gaps that have existed in the past on the issue of privacy and how privacy relates to cross-border data flows. So it's a very good model for us to follow. Um, and, and I think that will really open the doors to ensure that both exist hand in hand. That's excellent. Thank you. Uh, so appreciate your comments and thank you so much to our audience. Those are great questions. I hope you'll uh, keep them coming. Uh, Dr. Chalky, we now turn to you for your thoughts. Uh, if you don't mind giving us sort of your initial um, comments and then we'll move into the questions. Sure. Um, thank you so much again for, for having me. It is such a pleasure to be part of this important conversation today. And um, from my angle, which is more of the environmental and social angle, I think as we set the stage for the conversation, it's really important to talk about COP21. And COP21 was the uh, Paris Climate uh, Summit and Agreement in 2015. And while there are um, serious criticisms of COP21 with respect to the, you know, generalities that were agreed there and the lack of enforcement mechanisms, what is really important to highlight is this was the first time in history when almost 200, 200 countries came together on a pressing global issue, climate change and they actually reached an agreement. 
that is a really significant milestone. And again, it's the first time in history. And as we know, the Trump ad administration withdrew from the uh, Paris Climate Accord. And I personally really um, uh, celebrate the fact that the Biden administration reversed that and decided to rejoin because if for no other reason, symbolically, this is critically important for us and as a society to have the necessary collective action to move towards uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. This is absolutely essential at the, at the country level. Having said that, it's also important to emphasize that there has been a lot of voluntary action done, uh, in particular in the private sector. And, and that's important because when we look at the global economy and what has happened as a result of globalization and, and, and technological advancement, the, um, the most recent data I have available is 2016, but as of 2016, when you look at the 100 largest economic entities in the world, of these 70, 70 are corporations. So basically you look at the 100 largest economic actors and of that two thirds are companies or private sector vis-a-vis -vis or in contrast with the remaining one third, which are countries. So we are dealing with a private sector and with corporations that have economic activities in excess of most countries. So when we, that, can be a whole separate conversation. So I'm not going to go into that. It has its um, uh, challenges and issues, but from the perspective of environmental and social action, when you have the private sector coming together and agreeing to some voluntary measures that can be very impactful and very, very powerful. And that can often be done faster and more efficiently than when the countries try to agree and then things trickle down from there. So again, not discounting the importance of the country level uh, consensus and collective action, it's absolutely critical. But at the same time, we also have to talk about what is happening separately and in parallel in the private sector. And it's very interesting because well before 2015, well before COP21, uh, there was there have had been significant movement in this regard. So the the UN's global compact was launched in year 2000, and currently there are 13,000 companies that participate from 170 countries, and that's all about environmental and social and working together in a collaborative fashion on how companies can have more positive social and environmental impact. Um, from my background and my experience, it was, it's been also very clear that financing is a, is a huge driver. So the IFC, uh, where I spent almost two decades, was also a champion in this area. IFC launched its performance standards in the early 2000s, which is basically a set of environmental and social standards. And all IFC lending around the world had to comply with those environmental and social lending. Then we went a step further and we worked with banks and financial intermediaries around the world to build their capacity and have them implement similar standards in their own lending activities. Uh, and IFC would only give a loan or a credit line or an, make an investment in any financial intermediary or bank if they adopted those standards. So there is a lot that can be done in the private sector in this sort of fashion where these are significant incentives. You can only get this loan if you implement these standards. So, so, so there is a lot that actually has happened um, since 2000 in, in this area, uh, but the, uh, at the same time, we definitely have to be working also at the country level because there is a lot that this collective action among countries need to pursue in addition to the uh, private action. Uh, but I wanted to highlight that because in some ways when you talk about globalism, 
these multilateral organizations that have played a critical role in this space over the past 20 plus years, the UN, the World Bank, IFC, uh, these organizations are globalist organizations. Their shareholders are countries from around the world. And they are sort of a hybrid when we speak about globalism and, and, and they can play this very, very critical role of convening, coming to consensus and implementing these kinds of standards when it comes to environmental and, and social activities. And so as a result of that, when you think about what has happened, for example, the Trump administration reversed almost 100 environmental policies as we all know it. Uh, but it was very interesting to see some of the corporate reactions. So when it came to emission standards, there was a group of car manufacturers which explicitly went against the administration and they voluntarily adapted much stricter standards than what was legally required. So it shows that companies are, are in some ways on a, on a parallel track. And, and in part that's because as we, we've been talking about it, there is this whole trend of corporate social responsibility and ESG and companies have been making commitments in that regard to their constituencies and they want to stay the course. But on the other hand, there are also studies that have shown that for companies, the worst thing in some ways is uncertainty. So if there is this change in policies, weaker standards, stronger standards, and they adjust their operations to that, that is very disruptive. So in some ways for companies, they rather stick with the higher standards and, and operate under those conditions of, of, of certainty. Um, and, and one last point as we start this conversation that I would love to make is while a lot of the emphasis in the um, early 2000s have been on climate and environmental action, it has become very clear over the last couple of years, but in particular as a result of the pandemic, that we cannot just focus on climate. We have a, 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 a dual pressure, a dual pressure from inequality and climate. And the two are intertwined in such a complex way that any um, actions and programs we do in the ESG, environmental and social area, absolutely have to address both of those. So based on the information that have been released about the Biden plan, what gives me optimism is that plan, while still lacking a lot of specifics and details, but it seems to be very cognizant of that, the intertwined nature of some of the most pressing social issues we are facing both globally and in the United States, in particular inequality and uh, climate change. That's excellent. Uh, you know, one of the things that struck me as you were speaking was really the parallelism between what you're saying and, and the dynamic and role of private industry in conjunction with um, either standards or multilateral obligations and what um, Ambassador Marantis was saying on the trade side. And, you know, um, in, in many ways, I think in both areas, industry really has been the prime mover in many of those uh, relationships. Um, so I think that's a good segue then into talking about uh, global value change. So you've spent nearly uh, over a decade actually in, in analyzing and developing uh, value chains. Um, this has increased over time and it's become a, a, a fundamental topic within the trade discussion. Could you clarify for us uh, the distinction between a supply chain and a value chain, and then talk about how the pandemic has affected those um, global value chains and how you think the Biden administration's policies could uh, impact those? Yes, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, so uh, just to clarify, I did not uh, put together value chains, but my, my work has very much focused on understanding, analyzing, and leveraging these value chains for uh, global value chains for, for social and environmental good. And, and they are important because um, they right now, or actually, again, the data is from a couple of years ago, so I do not have the most recent information, but um, global value chains represented 80, 80 percent of global trade. And, and, and that's a very large number. And when we talk about globalization and the um, 
outsourcing of many jobs from places like the United States or the, the developed world. Um, what has actually happened with the help of these global value chains is the low skilled wage sensitive jobs got offshored, but the companies still at their headquarter or head office level kept many of the higher skill, um, higher wage specialized jobs like branding and marketing design, etc. So, of course, it, so therefore, in some ways, in terms of profit generation, so it, there are some incredibly fascinating analysis, for example, of the value of an iPhone. Like where does that, the, the, the price you pay for an iPhone, who actually gets that? And considering a value chain that touches dozens of countries, who actually benefits from that value? What is the distribution of that value? And a, without going into a lot of detail, if anyone is interested, I have these um, charts and everything, so happy to share. But the, the, the fascinating part is that when you look at it, a very large chunk of the value actually accrues domestically to the head office because of these high, va high value activities that are being carried out there. Of course, this creates enormous issues in the labor market. So suddenly we, uh, once these um, lower skill uh, wage sensitive jobs got offshored, as we all know it, it created a disequilibrium in the labor market um, in ways that uh, created some very, very significant social problems and contributed to the inequality that we are facing today. And, and, and so, as we talk about these value chains, um, it's important to distinguish, and just for those who are not uh, familiar with, with this, I'm happy to clarify that when we talk about supply chains, um, that is really about material transfer. Supply chain is tracking the material transfer related to a particular product. When we talk about value chains, then we actually track the value created. Uh, even if it's non-material. So when Dimitrios was talking about uh, digital trade and the various digital services, that's a fantastic example of the non-material um, value that is, is, is being transferred and created in a value chain. And increasingly in a 21st century economy, those kinds of activities and services represent very significant um, value. So that's why it's really important for us to keep in mind the value chain concept, in addition to obviously, you know, um, supply chains are always part of the conversation. Uh, just want to point out maybe uh, one more thing. Um, so as we, um, when we, when we think of these value chains, I, as I mentioned, in the first 20 years of the 21st century or 18 years, there was a very strong move towards a lot of trade going through these global value chains. But then even before COVID, um, there were some mega trends that started that resulted in a certain degree of reversal of these value chain dynamics. And one of them is the uh, technology that is becoming available like 3D printing and automation have enabled um, some of the reshoring. So some companies have strategically started moving back some of these activities um, on shore. Uh, the other thing that happened is what we have been talking about here, which is ESG and, and the increased focus on environmental and social considerations. And when you are dealing with these incredibly complex value chains, there are many companies that I worked with in my past who really did not have a good understanding of who is in their value chain. It's very hard to track that value chain uh, entirely, but at the same time, Often the companies that we know, the lead firms, the ones that have the brands that we consume, they are kept accountable, if nothing else, by, by, by the public and by their consumers for any kind of um, uh, poor practices that happen in the value chain. So just think about the Bangladeshi fires in the garment factories. So those, the, the 
all the companies that were sourcing their cotton goods from there. I remember sitting in Dhaka, Bangladesh, in an event with all those companies where they were talking about how they really wanted to make sure that they prevent these sorts of tragedies from happening, but they don't own those factories. In these value chains, most of the companies, uh, they, they operate through their purchasing power. And of course that gives them a lot of leverage to impose standards and rules, but they don't really have full control. So it introduces a really interesting problem when it come to the, comes to these global value chains. And, and, and some of these considerations have also shifted um, companies towards reshoring some of the activities and trying to have a little better control and uh, understanding of the value chain that um, they were operating with. Those are some great points. I'd like to take a couple of our uh, audience questions that dovetail with that. Um, so have you seen within your research or with the information that you've reviewed a noticeable shift by consumers toward um, companies that uh, have, have basically operated, I guess, value chains that are more uh, aligned with ESG principles or more environmentally conscious. Absolutely. And there are some very good studies out there that actually is showing the increased um, awareness um, of consumers um, when it comes to this topic. And of course, the younger generations in particular are, are very interested and they are becoming very important consumers as they are getting older and, and have more income. So definitely there is strong evidence that people care about these issues more and more and, and um, companies don't, don't take that lightly. So another audience question, um, this is Texas and energy is key here, maybe king, okay. Uh, the other thing though is that uh, fossil fuel kind of based uh, petrochemical industries are significant, but so are renewables. So the question really relates more to uh, the old economy energy. And, and the idea is, are there opportunities for enhancing efficiency within the fossil fuel industry? Um, and how can businesses, and in particular, small and medium-sized businesses um, provide value within that and, and still find a way forward separate from renewables? I don't know who asked that question, but I'm really thrilled that it was asked because that is one of my areas of passion, in particular energy efficiency. And I was sitting here really frustrated during the Texas freeze and ended up writing an op-ed which um, ended up being published by the Houston Chronicle because we have 20 plus years experience internationally when it comes to energy efficiency. And energy efficiency is such an important area because it is really friendly to small business. It is an area that where you're touching kind of both sides of the equation. Energy efficiency helps to reduce cost, both for households or businesses, therefore making them more resilient, more competitive. On the other hand, energy efficiency is a sector where there are enormous opportunities for small businesses to engage and, and, and to thrive. So it's, um, to me, it, is, it has always been the low-hanging fruit. When you look at what is the cost of saving a kilowatt of energy versus new production of the same kilowatt of energy, typically the energy efficiency measures are significantly cheaper. So both at the system and at the micro level, it just makes so much sense. And, um, and I do believe that in Texas in particular, this recent freeze um, is going to generate, um, it has already generated a lot of momentum. Um, we have seen here in the Institute, a lot of interest, um, so many inquiries after the op-ed. And, uh, and I do think that uh, globally speaking, again, you cannot generalize because of course, energy efficiency is very much a function of um, climate. Uh, when it comes to kind of heating and cooling solutions, which tend to be quite uh, significant in the energy efficiency space. But when you look at SMEs, small, small, small and medium sized businesses, um, I worked is extensively in this area in my previous life. And, and one of the things that is clear is that, um, for example, when a, a small business upgrades, let's say it's manufacturing equipment, to a higher standard. Yes, definitely there is a 
um, it, it, payment, there is a cost to that. But very often that newer equipment does not only have the energy efficiency benefits and therefore uh, kind of uh, savings benefits, but it also often is more productive. It can produce more and it can produce at a better uh, it can produce better quality. So one specific example I remember was a small business in the Balkans. They were do, making uh, olive oil. And even though just purely from the energy savings, this new equipment they purchased did not necessarily pay for itself. We have the concept of payback, which is how many years does it take for this investment to pay for itself, just from savings. And maybe on that, it would have taken them 10 years. But when you took into account that suddenly this equipment also let them produce the olive oil at a stable temperature, which improved the quality of the olive oil, and therefore they were able to sell that olive oil at a higher price, suddenly it became a, an investment that had a payback of two or three years and it was a no brainer. So um, yes, I think there is a lot to be done at the efficiency level. And um, and, and I think Texas is, is now really uh, aware of that. And, and, and I think globally speaking, that's an important topic. And getting back to the original theme of the Biden administration plans and policies, the Biden administration in the plans have assigned close to, I think, $600 billion for energy efficiency related measures. And I think that's a really enlightened um, step because as I said, when done right, energy efficiency can really help in multiple ways. But what is going to be important is that the, again, the specifics are not clear yet. And it's going to be really important that the policies are designed so that small businesses can benefit from it. Uh, and that, that takes an intentional smart policy approach uh, to make sure that happens. I'd like to step back uh, just for a moment too and just ask you to explain a little more what ESG actually is. Um, and, and you know, I would say, how does it just differ or is it just rebranding a prior concepts of sustainability or other names that we've seen out there for years? So, um, so as I said, the topic of ESG has been around for a long time. And terminology wise, we really started using ESG in the finance context. So, um, now we use it much more broadly, but initially uh, when you talk about, for example, the UN Global Compact back, back in 2000, they were not using the, the ESG narrative and terminology. Uh, the, the overall trends in this space have really been much more around SDGs, which stands for Sustainable Development Goals. And these are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals uh, that have been um, kind of said by the United Nations in extensive consultation with member countries. And, 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 and the, these SDGs have actually been, while I kind of at the philosophical level, I do have some issues with ex exactly, um, you know, their structure, but what they have been really effective for and really constructive for is to provide a common language and a common framework. And you see many companies nowadays specifically identifying in their annual reports which ESG they are working on and different programs they are doing, what ESG are they aiming to touch. So the ESG framework has provided us that uh, common language across sectors, across stakeholders, which has been very constructive and very helpful. When it comes to uh, ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social and Governance, um, as I said, that really started from finance and investing. And we, we started in the finance space using that basically to make sure that when, for example, IFC, where I worked, was a pioneer in this, when we make an investment, we wanted to make sure that our money only goes to companies uh, in the developing world that 
adhere to certain environmental, social, and governance standards. And then from there, uh, lots of many other multilaterals um, ad ad adopted ESG standards. And then right now you see even mainstream banks, um, investors using that, which is, which, is, which is fantastic. But what really have given a, an impetus to ESG has been the studies that have come out that actually show that portfolios that adhere to ESG standards actually perform better. And in the early days of ESG, the, the focus was very much on risk. We focused, I remember the first kind of uh, first uh, standards that were released by IFC. The focus was very much on uh, controlling or trying to limit harm. It's a do no harm, let's manage the risks, environmental and social risks approach. But over time, these standards have actually involved not only managing the downside and trying to manage the risks associated with environmental and social and governance practices, but also to the upside. There are great opportunities. Energy efficiency, like we've been talking about, is a, is a great example where somebody can finance energy efficiency projects, which is creating opportunities it's not about risk management. It's about funding new opportunities in the market that can be very attractive and profitable. So now we are at the point where um, it, it, really the ESG standards cover that entire spectrum, both risks and opportunities. And the um, evidence is absolutely clear um, based on different studies that have been published that these portfolios simply just perform better. Yeah, and Ava, just to interrupt you, you know, from, from Visa's perspective, I mean, what you said is completely spot on. Sustainability is a huge driver for us. ESG is a huge driver for us. You know, we've committed to moving towards 100% renewable energy in our global facilities. 70% of our global square footage at Visa has achieved a green office certification. Um, you know, we have green teams in place. Um, and, and as you said, you know, no single company or entity can do it alone. This is a real, you know, across the ecosystem um, um, play where NGOs, businesses, governments, and businesses are, need to focus on ESG related issues together. So uh, what you said is it, like, it's very live for us. Thank you so much for saying that because sometimes, you know, uh, sitting here right now in, in a university, I think um, we are sometimes a little bit more disconnected, but the, uh, I have to say again in my previous life, but, but you just articulated it uh, so uh, wonderfully. I heard this from so many companies and I really think that I'm, I'm not claiming that every company is at that point, but there are definitely these corporate leaders who are, in, in that mind frame and who really have internalized ESG and, and, and it has become part of their fabric. And, and so it's no longer PR or let's just put something in the annual report. And, and what I see happening also is that it, there is a lot of peer pressure. So the companies that are perhaps less advanced in this area are really looking to the leaders and seeing how successfully they are doing this. So, so it's, it's, it's starting to trickle down, not to mention that there are some of these uh, corporate uh, frameworks like the consumer, I think it's called Consumer Goods Forum, which has done a phenomenal job by bringing together some of the corporate leaders and agreeing on some new standards and measures. And then the rest of the industry follows suit and, and, and also adopts the same measures. That's actually a good segue to what I think probably is our last question. It comes from our audience, but it really, in my opinion, comes down to uh, accountability and enforcement. So we've heard about all the wonderful things that companies are doing on their own with, uh, I guess, pressure or impetus from maybe their boards of directors, from their consumers, um, from their suppliers, you fill in the blank, right? At, at the same time though, when it comes to uh, international organizations, or even uh, other standards that are out there in the private sector. How, how do you actually hold uh, companies accountable for, for meeting the commitments that they've said they want to meet? 
Yeah, you are, whoever asked the question, it's spot on. So that's really the, 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 the tricky part of this. And, and, and how do you do this so you don't tie their hands? Uh, so you let companies do the innovative, um, agile things that they, they, they naturally do. Um, and uh, so, so there are disclosure requirements, right? And we are moving, and, and, and the disclosure piece I think is really important. So we are moving in the direction where just making this statement in a, statements in and of themselves really don't mean anything to anyone. So it has to be supported by disclosure. And there are um, calls for standardizing disclosures. Uh, there are actually, um, like for example, it, sometimes disclosure can happen on an incentive basis. For example, the example I mentioned, financier is not going to give you money unless you adopt these standards. And uh, I remember doing this at IFC, every quarter we had to do the monitoring of these investments. And we actually had the environmental and social specialist visit the companies and they actually did the monitoring to make sure that th there was compliance. And if there wasn't, then there was a clause in the in the legal agreement, so we could we could pool the funding. So 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 these are just kind of private sector based um, enforcements and disclosures, but there is definitely a call and a movement towards standardizing disclosures, and some countries are actually adopting uh, sort of at the at the legal policy level. Um, national disclosure requirements. So I think it was just New Zealand. New Zealand yesterday announced, I think it's going to be the first country that is going to have ESG disclosure requirements. So uh, jur the jury is still out how well that works. Uh, so, so far it's been mostly on the, uh, kept within the private sector with the exception that, as I mentioned, multilateral organizations have played a really, um, important role in this space. And so, like I mentioned, the IFC example of monitoring and uh, uh, enforcement of compliance, uh, that has often been the case that it's these multilateral organizations that play some degree, some role in the, in the monitoring. Um, often there is no tool for financing is nice because there you have a very natural enforcement mechanism. Um, in other cases, you don't have that. Um, so, so there is the peer pressure, there are other tools. So, so this is still work in progress and um, fantastic question from whoever asked it. Thank you. And uh, unfortunately we're at the end of our time, but we really appreciate uh, your comments. Just in closing, could each of you give us a few takeaways for our audience on um, this topic? Ambassador Morantis? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start. I mean, I look, I think the key takeaway is, you know, going back to, I, I feel like a one trick pony today with, on digital trade. But um, what I would say is wins on digital trade are wins for small businesses. Barriers to data flows are barriers to small to small businesses. So if we want to make trade policy relevant to small businesses, which are the real generator of jobs in this country, then we've got to have a smart trade policy that focuses on removing barriers to digital trade and allowing small businesses full participation in the expansion of global e-commerce. Dr. Chucky? I would like to echo uh, Demet Demetrius's closing uh, comments. Uh, I, I personally also believe that we have to focus on small business and it really takes a smart and intentional policy approach to do that. Uh, small businesses already suffered tremendously before the pandemic as a result of pandemic uh, many of them had to shut down or, or, or struggling financially. And it's not enough to put money into the system because very often, for example, uh, I could not agree uh, more with Demetrios, use of technology and digital commerce are incredibly important, but there are often barriers, barriers in terms of access to the technology, in terms of um, in training and capacity. So there has to be a holistic, uh, comprehensive approach 
to make sure that the uh, recovery very much focuses on empowering and enabling small businesses to thrive. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Morantis and Dr. Chalky. We re really appreciate your time. Um, on behalf of the SME Rolling Center, the Tower Center, and the Hunt Institute, we thank you for joining us today and sharing your expertise. We're also thankful to our audience for your participation in uh, our program. I'm sure we could have gone on for much more, and I really wish we could. But we appreciate your involvement and your support of SMU. Uh, for more information on our respective organizations and programming, in the future, you can find us on the web or follow us on social media. Um, Bora, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we close? No, I just want to say thank you so much to our speakers. This was a great discussion and we really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll continue to do more programs like this and more partnerships. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, everyone. Have a good end of the semester and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.